Welcome. I'm Seema Kumar, Vice President for Innovation, Global Health and Science Policy Communications at Johnson & Johnson. And welcome to a Champions of Science live broadcast announcing the Dr. Paul Janssen Award. Today, we're here to honor the life of Dr. Paul Janssen, the work of this year's award recipient and the importance of science in our world today. COVID-19 has changed the life as we know it. The disease has taken more than 930,000 lives. Schools and businesses remain closed and something as common as a handshake now seems a distant concept. COVID-19 has also changed how we celebrate the Dr. Paul Janssen Award. Under normal circumstances, this award ceremony has taken place in person with many guests in both New York and in Belgium, the home of Dr. Paul. But as all of you have adjusted so much of your lives this year, we too adjusted today's celebration to this virtual event. I'm here at the powerhouse, Johnson & Johnson's historical museum, and will be joined by guests calling in remotely from all over the world to celebrate the spirit of scientific curiosity that Dr. Paul embodied. As we see the global scientific community work with unprecedented speed to develop a vaccine, we are reminded that scientists are key fighters on the front lines of every, everyday health crisis that we face today and will also face in the future. That's why Johnson & Johnson created Champions of Science, to convene and catalyze the scientific advocates, innovators, leaders, and help people of all generations and backgrounds to see the unlimited opportunities that science can create. As a global healthcare company, we recognize the important role that we at Johnson & Johnson can have in promoting the work of people solving the world's biggest scientific problems and bringing new generations and audiences into the conversation. And today, we're gonna to do just that. We're gonna to speak to some of the world's leading scientists and some of the next generation's most promising researchers. We're also going to honor a tremendous scientist, Dr. Lewis Cantley, for his lifetime of groundbreaking research and the critical role he has played in fighting diseases from cancer to diabetes. Dr. Cantley represents the legacy of innovation that Dr. Paul Janssen Award has always celebrated. Dr. Paul was a visionary who believed fiercely in science's promise and worked tirelessly to bring treatments and cures to people. Let's explore a little bit more about the man who inspired today's event, his work, and his incredible legacy. Dr. Paul Janssen, or Dr. Paul as he was known throughout the global scientific community, was one of the 20th century's most innovative and inspiring scientists. Widely considered the most prolific drug inventor of all time, Dr. Paul and the teams he led discovered over 80 new medications, forever improving the treatment of infectious diseases, psychiatric treatment, pain management, and anesthesia. It was actually a moment of great tragedy that inspired Paul Janssen to choose the path he did. When Paul was in high school, his four-year-old sister died of tuberculosis meningitis, a loss that affected him deeply. Later in life, he said that this loss drove him to pursue a career in medical research. After completing his education, Dr. Paul was determined to start his own research lab a novel institution devoted to the idea that by modifying chemical compounds, one could create new and effective synthetic medications. Despite tremendous doubt from the academic community, Dr. Paul and his team quickly found success, discovering several promising drugs in those early years and never looking back. For nearly 50 years, Dr. Paul tirelessly continued to take on new challenges fighting to combat global health inequities. He battled child mortality in Africa, helped to create research centers in China, and toward the end of his career, worked to create treatments for HIV. He was author or co-author of more than 850 scientific publications and was granted over 100 patents. Today, eight Janssen medicines are on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. Dr. Paul was gifted with a brilliant mind, but more importantly, he was blessed an undying passion. He never gave up and he never tired. At the time of his death in 2003, he was investigating treatments for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. While he didn't live to see this goal achieved, 
Janssen's treatment has since been approved in the US and the European Union. In the end, Dr. Paul's greatest legacy may be his tenacity. A generation of researchers look up to him, not just for the work he did, but for his constant reminder that there was more work to be done. Of course, working at Johnson & Johnson, I've been long familiar with the work of Dr. Paul. But I have to say that every time I revisit his incredible life story and legacy, I feel inspired all over again. We're lucky enough to be joined now by somebody who knew Dr. Paul and worked closely with him. And that's Dr. Paul Stoffels, Johnson & Johnson's chief scientific officer. We're also joined by Sue Desmond Hellman, an oncologist and biotechnology leader who served as a CEO of the Dell and Melinda Gates Foundation from 2014 to 2020, and previously as president of product development at Genentech, where she played a key role in the development of cancer drugs. I'm thrilled to be here today with Paul and Sue because both have such valuable perspective on what it means to be an innovator and also because both have been working on the front lines of our current pandemic. So Paul and Sue are going to join us. Hi, Paul. How are you? Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Hello. Hmm. Hello. So Paul, you're standing in front of the Paul Janssen Research Center in Belgium in Beersa. Sorry I couldn't be there. Good yeah, unfortunately with there. COVID, we can't be here, so, uh, but this is the best uh, possible way to connect now with, uh, with uh, the video through uh, the internet. So uh, thank you, Seema, for welcoming us. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you're, you're there right next to Dr. Paul's statue. You, of course, had the privilege of working very closely with him. He was your mentor and your teacher. And what made him a mentor and teacher? Why did he inspire you so much? Talk well, a little bit about he, uh, he learned me how to make medicines and how to focus. Uh, Dr. Janssen always said, uh, solve important medical problems uh, which are worth solving. And that is uh, very, mostly the deadly disease, deadly infections, cancer, other. Uh, but he learned on how to inspire to start with innovation and start with research, but never give up. Uh, we know all as leaders in R&D that uh, we have more failures than successes, and we need to learn from our failures and to, uh, and to continue. And many of our medicines, they are the result of, of long time uh, research, not just five years, most of it 10 to 20 years. Um, Second, he also learned me to hire good people, hire better people than yourself, he always said. Hire people who know more than you and form a strong team, and then you will be smarter than anybody else and solve problems. You know? um, and then he also um, learned the principle of you take the risk, I take the blame. So as a senior leader, you have to give your team the environment and the space to take risk, to be entrepreneurial and get to solutions while failing several times. And our company has been very successful based on those principles and those management principles over so many years and resulting in an extreme number of new medicines, but also more importantly, significant years of life saved and years of quality of life generated. Thank you, Paul. So it's all about leadership, leadership, science, courage. And of course, you know, um, you've been at the Gates Foundation most recently and before that at Genentech, responsible for the development of so many drugs. Talk a little bit about the importance of curiosity and perseverance and also lessons learned, actually, both your time at Genentech and the Gates Foundation, navigating critics and barriers to research as well. Well, well, thanks, Seema. I'm really happy to be here with you and Paul today. I was inspired in the video by the line, patients are waiting. Uh, and maybe on the leadership front, I'd point out a few things that that have always, it, it always inspired me and pushed me to try and be a better leader. And one is that sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. Always keeping Always in front of you front of who you're, you're serving, serving, whether it's whether um, children, you know, in children in sub-Saharan Africa, Africa or patients with or cancer patients who are struggling and suffering. We used to have a saying at Genentech I just loved, uh, imagine what's possible for patients. And I think a great leader really puts out that vision, that imagination, um, no matter what obstacle, what barrier, what's possible if we succeed if we keep dusting ourselves off and trying again. And I want to build on what Paul said about hiring people better than you. 
I so agree with that, um, hiring people that are better than you, but would add one additional thing. I often would judge myself, and to this day, I continue to judge myself as a leader and a manager by whether or not people who I hired or who reported to me um, are on a, a trajectory for themselves that's um, more inspiring, better for them than they could have imagined. And if, if there was either an encouraging word or a nudge <laughs> or a push um, that I could do as a leader, inspired by that vision of what's possible, that, that could elevate them as, as people who contribute, then I would feel so proud of them. And, and the most important thing for me as a leader would be that somehow I helped them and nobody needed to know that, that, that it could be totally behind the scenes. Uh, no one needed to know that, that they were working or struggling or trying to improve. And, and I know when I've worked for people who, as leaders who I want to follow, those are some of the characteristics I see in them. That's wonderful. That's so, so, so great to sort of be a leader from behind the scenes and it's also being a servant leader, which is a, a lovely, lovely thing. That's what Dr. Paul was as well. Um, Paul, um, we're going through an unprecedented pandemic. I mean, who would have thought we would find ourselves in this particular situation? But it also brings, um, I think, another thing to light, which is the engagement of the public and of many other people who are typically not involved in the scientific enterprise are now completely involved and completely informed and looking for more information. What can we do to better establish this connectivity between the public and between scientists and institutions so that people don't feel left out of you know, the enterprise of science? How can we yeah, bridge that gap? In these times, we have to be very transparent and uh, we, we have to communicate scientific results uh, through the appropriate channels to people who then can explain what they, they mean. But we have to be transparent at every step in, uh, in, in, in this development. We are now developing vaccines in uh, probably 12 months, 12 to 18 months, and make them available on a very, very large scale, making people understand that we don't cut corners, that we do fundamentally the right work to to evaluate the, pro, the, the, the new vaccines in, uh, in clinical trials, but do it all extremely accelerated in collaboration with, with many different partners. We work with the NIH, the NIAID, with different research centers in South America, South Africa, Europe, and we have partners from other parts of society who are doing this together with us. And so we can communicate about it, they are communicating about it, and hopefully we can put full transparency on the results and on the science we do. But it's a different effort now and it needs to be very clear because people will have to get trust in the products we make in order to get an end to this vaccine, uh, to, this, um, to this pandemic. Thank you, Paul. So you're familiar with Dr. Cantley's research, of course. And in fact, I remember you telling me about a photograph in which the two of you were together and you were talking to each other, which was really, really great. And you're an oncologist, you've developed products for, for cancer, and so you must be very familiar with his work. Talk to us a little bit about why his research is so important. Well, uh, Seema, as you and I talked, I, I looked back and I found that uh, photo in 2011. He was at University of California, San Francisco, and um, I love the photo because it, it, we're both animated <laughs> talking about his science. What's special about Dr. Cantley's work is, um, is that he's made a massive contribution to precision medicine for cancer. And we can be more precise in treating cancer because of a much more deep understanding. And in Dr. Cantley's case, there was always this sense that your metabolism, that how your body works and how your body processes sugar isn't just important in diabetes, how cancer cells metabolize, how cancer cells uh, process sugars is extremely important in how cancers grow and spread. And so this whole research in cancer metabolism was a little foggy. Uh, it was a bit theoretical, but talked about a lot when I was uh, in my training. 
And what Dr. Cantley and, and colleagues have done is make much more precise the pathways of how, in fact, um, the gene he's worked on, a cancer oncogene, um, helps the cancer grow and spread in ways that are very destructive, very serious, and do tap into the pathways that are very similar to how we metabolize sugar. Um, and so he, this whole field has broken open. There's already an approved drug for leukemia, and I think many more to come because of this deep understanding. And again, it's curiosity-driven science. How do things work? How do the cells grow and spread? What's their competitive advantage? And his work has really allowed us to more deeply understand how things work. Thank you, Sue. And to both of you, I'm going to ask, you know, um, what inspires you during times like this? Now, here we are celebrating uh, the achievement, scientific achievement of someone who is well deserving of this achievement. We're also talking a lot about science and the importance of science in solving this current pandemic that we're in. What gives you hope? What inspires you during this time? Paul, you first. Well, what inspires me most is the extreme collaboration and, and the, between all of the different groups involved in the world on bringing products forward, especially now for the, the COVID uh, vaccine or COVID medicines. It's unprecedented how industry, government, NIH, FDA, CDC, but also in Europe, the regulatory agencies, the clinical centers, everyone works together to find hours and days in development programs to shorten uh, and reviews. 24-7 work uh, for all the teams around the world and how we do this collaboratively. Uh, it inspires me to see that the world works together now to put an, hopefully put an end to this pandemic soon and with a big commitment to make products available in an equitable, equitable way on a very large scale in the world. And with that, help as many as possible people and, and hopefully we finish the pandemic soon. Uh, so the collaboration and the passion people bring to, uh, to this problem now is un unbelievable and never seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sue, what inspires yeah. you? Well, I want to just endorse what Paul just said, but let me say something else. It, having been at Genentech and then at uh, UC San Francisco and Gates Foundation, I've spent the last decade in not-for-profit, um, and uh, I... I I think that one of the really inspiring, hopeful things about this pandemic is how fantastic industry is. Um, industry collaborates broadly with academia, with, with foundations, with the federal government and others. But when I see the scale of the investment, when I say, see the scope of what's needed for production and R&D and doing you know, 30,000 patient plus clinical trials, one of the things I've always felt is that pharma and biotech um, are massive assets to the world. And I think in this pandemic, we're seeing that, the talent, the passion, the commitment, uh, and the investment. Uh, it, we all have a lot of work to do to help the public feel comfortable with what's happening during this pandemic, whether it's vaccines or therapeutics or diagnostics. And there's much more work to do on that front but I'm hopeful because I know so many colleagues like the two of you in industry uh, are making commitments and investments and going safely but quickly uh, to make remedies. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate all your comments. Really glad to be here. Thanks a lot. Great to see you. Thank you, Simon. Mm -hmm. So it's always wonderful and excellent to hear them speak and their passion for innovation. And that's exactly what the Paul Janssen Award is all about, recognizing scientific innovation and championing those who work to make it a reality. It's been 16 years since we first launched the Dr. Paul Janssen Award, and it's amazing to reflect on how much this initiative has grown and to hear from past honorees. So let's take a closer look at the history of today's awards and the innovative spirit it represents. The inscription on the back of the Dr. Paul Janssen Award medallion reads, What's new? It is the question that Dr. Paul asked his research and development teams daily, a philosophy that at once inspired and encouraged his colleagues. 
It is that spirit of striving, of curiosity, of endless pursuit of scientific breakthroughs that we see in each recipient of the award that bears his name. The discoveries and innovations of past winners have revolutionized the way we identify and treat disease and allowed patients to live healthier, fuller lives. Discovery is enabling scientists around the world to figure out how the uh, underlying genetic changes in a cell lead to disease and how we can potentially use this technology to correct genetic mutations in humans someday. We're f facing daunting problems, things like health issues, some, some kinds of cancer and things that we're now beginning to get a grasp on, on how to treat them and how to perhaps actually cure a large number of people in ways that were unimaginable a while back. You have given so much time and energy to this research for so long and people like me are alive because of it. That is the power of science. It remains the foundation for every medical breakthrough in human history and the key to delivering the next generation of treatments and cures. In order for science to continue to advance societal goals, it will require new influxes of young people. The young people are generally the ones with the best ideas, the freshest ideas, the newest ideas. Now, more than ever, science needs champions. Champions who will help humanity drive innovation, fuel research, and never tire of asking that simple question, what's new? As you can see, the men and women who have won this award in the past have been tremendous contributors to biomedical research. This year's winner is no exception. In the 1980s, Dr. Lewis Cantley's team discovered a key enzyme called phosphoinositide 3 kinase, or PI3K for short. This enzyme, which promotes cell growth and division, produces a lipid that had never before been seen in nature that leads to cancer. Dr. Cantley determined through his research that PI3K is in fact responsible for causing the majority of cancers that occur in human beings. Over the next 20 years, drugs which targeted this enzyme were developed and several key PI3K inhibitors have led to more effective and less disruptive treatments of cancer. It is for this revolutionary discovery and its impact that the selection committee, an independent selection committee of world-renowned scientists, chose Dr. Cantley as this year's award recipient. All of us here today at Johnson & Johnson are incredibly proud to be presenting Dr. Cantley with this very deserved honor. And now, I'd like to share a personal message of congratulations from Alex Gorski, Johnson & Johnson's Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Executive Committee. Hello, Dr. Cantley. And on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, I want to congratulate you on winning the 2020 Dr. Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research. Now this year, we have all been reminded of the vital role science plays throughout our society. And as we live through these extraordinary times, it is scientists working in partnership with governments and industry and other leaders who are frankly are giving the world hope as we take on the greatest public health challenge of our time. At Johnson & Johnson, we've always believed in the power of science to transform human health. It's been that way since our company was founded more than 130 years ago. And today, we're proud to celebrate champions of science like you, whose curiosity, courage, and unrelenting pursuit of knowledge fuels the kind of transformative innovation that will improve the health of people all around the world. Now each year when we present this award, I'm reminded of my early days at Johnson & Johnson, where I had the honor and privilege of getting to know Dr. Paul. An icon in the field of modern medicine, he was one of the most inspirational scientists of the 20th century and an advocate for future generations of innovators. Now, Dr. Paul believed that there's no limit to what we can accomplish through science. And he encourages colleagues to never be satisfied with the status quo. His famous phrase, the patients are waiting, is still very much part of our company's DNA as we work to address unmet healthcare needs all around the globe. And it's because of pioneers like Dr. Paul and you, Dr. Cantley, that our industry 
is able to take on the most daunting health challenges from chronic diseases such as diabetes and cancer to an unprecedented global health emergency on the scale of COVID-19. So thank you, Dr. Cantley, for your many years of innovation and leadership, for your contributions to improving the lives of patients, and for helping to build a world where science is valued and celebrated. Congratulations on this well-deserved honor. Dr. Cantley's work is truly inspiring, and he represents the pinnacle of what the Champions of Science program is all about. But the Jensen Award is just one aspect of the Champions of Science program. As we celebrate the storied career of Dr. Cantley, I can't help but think about the next generation of scientific innovators. The BioGenius Challenge is an international biotechnology competition held annually for high school students. The awardees are some of the best and the brightest of the next generation, and we're lucky enough to have this year's BioGenius Challenge winner joining us here today. Here, in our own words, is one of the next generation's most promising young minds, Shreya Ramesh. I've always been interested in science in general. This particular science fair journey that I've had all throughout high school has taken me to so many different places and has encouraged me a lot to pursue science as an actual career. The project that I essentially made is twofold. One, it focuses on the earlier diagnosis of different neurological disorders, more specifically ALS and Parkinson's. And the second part focuses a lot more on improving the quality of life for patients with different neurological disorders. By using a patient's voice recordings, this particular device, it's basically taking audio files and pushing it through different machine learning algorithms in order to determine if a patient has ALS. So basically, doctors can take measures to sort of slow down the onset of these particular diseases. It felt absolutely great to know that my work was being recognized at an international level. And this has really shown me that my project has the potential to save and help millions of different people. From the first moment I heard about Shriya's work, I knew she would make a big difference in the world. So I'm so glad that she can join us today. Joining us as well is Lisha Brown, who won the BioGenius Award in 2006 and now works as a global clinical development scientist at GlaxoSmithKline. Welcome to both of you and good to see you both. Hi. Hi, Shreya. Hi, Hi Lisha. Hi. How are you both Hi, doing? Hi, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, are you guys yeah. keeping healthy and safe? Good. Definitely. <laughs> Great. Try to stay active. Yes, yes, good idea. So to both of you, first let me uh, ask Shreya. Shreya, despite the pandemic, young people still don't seem to see science as relevant or interesting. And you, as a BioGenius uh, Challenge Award winner, I mean, you've interacted with many students who are interested in science, but then there's a whole swath of others who are not yet inspired into careers in STEM. How do we inspire more young scientists to enter STEM fields? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest ways to really inspire young minds to take up careers in STEM really comes down to the issue of accessibility. It's really, really important to make things like STEM education and other resources readily available to other young people in order to really show them like the potential applications of what these technologies can do. I think a lot of people my age are also really focused on the actual applications of such technologies. So essentially showing them that they can innovate and create solutions that can impact millions of people positively is really the first step. So Lisha, a question for you. Now, of course, your upbringing in rural Jamaica has inspired some of the current work that you're doing. Not only are you interested in science and also in health, but you're also interested in addressing healthcare inequalities. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, the connection between politics and personal identity. You know, how did these childhood experiences influence your work? And what are your, you doing now in these arenas? And what do you see as the biggest barriers in healthcare? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, growing up in Jamaica, um, it was really difficult to understand just the disparities that were being access to medicine. So then coming to the U.S. and seeing that this was also so very much a problem, 
I see that a lot of the issues are really very simple, but we tend to look at this larger picture of just let's get the access, but there's these smaller issues of just transportation, food security, like mental, like there's so much there that we can actually solve at a smaller level. And we don't think that that actually drives access to care, but it has everything to do with it. Um, I was helping with a volleyball clinic once in a very, um, uh, in a small neighborhood and a young lady there, no one really came to volleyball. And so she, I asked her, can you go out and find someone? So she was a big leader. She went out and she found all of these kids to come and play. And so I asked her, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What, like, what does that look like for you? And she basically just said, I just want to work in a, um, in a, 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 a restaurant that can bring food home. At such a young age, she had to think about something that was so out of her scope, she couldn't even think big and dream that that small access to food security could even get her access to care, couldn't even help her get beyond that. So if we can solve some of these smaller issues, access to medicines, access to even bringing kids to actually think beyond, I can be a scientist and that's okay. It starts at such a small level. Absolutely, everything is local, right? And I want to ask both of you, you both entered into careers in science um, and you know you are passionate about science. What inspired you? What led you to that career? So let me ask Shreya first and then Lisha. Absolutely. So I definitely think that I was always inspired and just curious about the world and just learning about how things work from a young age. So I always asked all these like questions, did like mini experiments and things like that at home. So my science fair journey really began in the eighth grade when we had to do this mandatory science fair project as part of our class. And this really inspired me to, you know, create these different solutions to all sorts of problems that I didn't know actually existed. And so because of that, I've really been inspired uh, really by, because of like two things. One, accessibility, just making sure that I can actually create solutions that are accessible to everyone around the world. And then two, also impact, making sure that I can, you know, create these technologies that can really impact positively so many people around the world. So really a lot of the stuff that I like and that I work on really focuses really on maximizing these two key points. Leisha? Uh, for You're me, it started you. really, it started, it started really simple, actually, just playing with my friends, honestly, and I would always be the one that wanted to take care of the babies if they were sick like with the dolls. And so I, you know, just talking with my family, they said, well, then you have to become a doctor. And I was like, okay, well, that could be a great route to take. As I continued, you know, through schooling, I moved to the U.S. And that's in the seventh grade. I was in a pre-med program that allowed me to go and shadow an obstetrician um, and to see that do a 12-hour shift per se, but they broke it apart because I was so much younger. But to see what that was like really inspired me such a great deal. And it continued to to have great like, mentors to really help me through. So being being able to be in a program called STEM prep that really then saw my potential and provided um, ability to to do research at such a young age. So it continued to kind of build just from my small interest, but then having great mentors and opportunities in place that kept it going. That's great. Uh, last question for both of you. You know, science has been an enterprise that has been mostly dominated by you know, white male scientists, right? It, has now, it hasn't historically been a very diverse enterprise. So as two, you know, uh, black and brown women, uh, what are your thoughts about, you know, diversity and inclusion in science? How can we take away the barriers? What can we do to inspire more diversity in STEM? Who wants to go first? Shreya, you wanna go first? Sure, yeah, I can take this question first. So I think one of the biggest things is that it's really great that we're seeing an upward trend in diversity, but whatever we're doing now doesn't need to stop. It needs to continue. And so one of the biggest ways that we can improve diversity is really by holding corporations accountable and making sure that biotechnology soon evolves into a kind of place where anyone and everyone is welcome, regardless of their age, gender, sexuality, every, um, you know, social, economic background, things like that. So making sure that we hold these corporations and other um, people really accountable in making sure that we create STEM, just uh, make STEM very a uh, safe place, especially is really important. And another way that we can do this is just by creating like safe spaces for women and other uh, people of color to just gather together, share their stories and things like that. 
Isha, your thoughts? Yeah, for me, um, coming from Jamaica, as, as I've shared before, I actually never had a, a long history of racism because when I go outside in Jamaica, people look like me. So I was able to see doctors and scientists that look just like me come into the U.S. and seeing the disparity, like the, the, the lack of diversity within the workplace, within my own school when I was in honor classes, it was very interesting to un get this different take from my born um, African-American friends. And so I think that a lot of it is individuals are working so hard to excel and do great and trying to break down barriers, but at the same time, we really need individuals that are in power to help break down the barriers that because they realize the privilege that they have. Because you have individuals continuously trying to break those down, but they're also just trying to excel and trying to make it. And it's, it's an exhaustive process when you don't have the individuals that are upholding that barrier trying to help break it down. So I really think just within the corporations, just like Shreya says, there really has to be more transparency about diversity and how to have inclusion, but also people willing to kind of step back and go, I'm here to help. Not because I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to look differently to other people, but because I truly do believe that these inequities need to be, to be changed. And so they really have to step back and take that as a challenge. Wonderful, beautifully said. I mean, you both inspire me so much. And, uh, you know, looking at the two of you and uh, looking at, you know, your passion, I know that the future of science is going to be bright. So thank you both for joining us and take care. Thank you so thank much. You. It's always wonderful. I love catching up with participants of the BioGenius Challenge because it makes me feel so confident about the future of STEM, about inclusion and about innovation. And as you can see, Lisha and Shreya are also excellent communicators. And at Johnson & Johnson, we believe that it's equally important that scientific innovators be able to produce compelling work as it is that they are able to explain it for general public. One of my favorite voices in advocating for science today is Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins is a renowned geneticist who in 1989 discovered the gene that causes cystic fibrosis. He formerly led the Human Genome Project, and he's currently the director of the National Institutes of Health. He couldn't join us live today, but he sent in this message. Hello. It gives me great pleasure as a fellow biomedical researcher and as the director of the National Institutes of Health to extend congratulations to Dr. Lewis Cantley on receiving the 2020 Dr. Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research. Uh, Lou, your pioneering discovery of the PI3 kinase pathway in the mid-1980s opened up a whole new insight into fundamental biology and also ways in which this pathway played important contributions in cancer and diabetes. Your research led to FDA approval of idelalisib in 2014 for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And for my lab that works on diabetes, we continue to appreciate uh, what you've contributed to that pathway of PI3K AKT in terms of insulin responsiveness and insulin resistance. So I'm also, by the way, proud to say NIH has supported your research over these many years. Looking back over your history, I couldn't help but be a little amused uh, by some of the stories that have a little resonance with my own. You grew up like I did on a farm, you in West Virginia, me in Virginia, and you were curious about science. West Virginia made fireworks illegal, so you made your own, and apparently everybody survived. And you thought biology was kind of messy, and so chemistry was what attracted you, as it did me. And taking that expertise in chemistry, uh, you figured out something that had eluded the field of lipids for 30 years, namely that there was this really important type of phosphatidyl inositol that was uh, phosphorylated at the three hydroxyl, and nobody believed it because they were all focused on the four and the five. And apparently it was a bit of a problem for you getting your papers published because they couldn't believe they had missed it. But by a variety of approaches, you ultimately won the day. And my goodness, the consequences for our understanding of really important cellular processes have continued to build ever since. So I think it's highly appropriate uh, that you have been chosen 
for this Champions of Science Award. And I am really pleased to have a chance just to join the group here uh, today, virtually as it has to be, and to wish you congratulations and many thanks uh, for your contributions to science. So with that, I uh, hope you enjoy the experience, virtual as it is, and many congratulations from all your friends at NIH. Thank you so much for those important thoughts, Dr. Collins. It's true that Dr. Cantley is proving just how impactful scientific innovation can be, not just for those who are within the scientific community, but for patients themselves. With all the highly technical discussions that we've been having about PI3K, it can be easy to lose sight of the human impact of Dr. Cantley's work. Here's a patient whose life was forever changed by Dr. Cantley's research. My name is Linda Whitfield, 65 years old, and I live in Norwood, Massachusetts. In 2005, when I was diagnosed with the HER2 positive cancer, um, I was told I would have to have chemotherapy, and it would be hung in bags. And when I, re you know, finished the chemo, I'd go home, and it would start taking effect. I had got everything that was supposed to happen of a side effect. I got. I almost didn't finish chemo. That's how severe it was. I was in remission until they found the cell, and now I had metastasized cancer, so I had it in my body and my bones, so that had to be addressed. So I was scared and frightened, but they introduced me to Dr. Jerick, who I adore. He's wonderful. And he told me that he was starting a trial that was um, one pill a day. That's all you had to do was take an oral pill a day. How could I say no? That was like the best from that hardcore chemo to that one pill. It is a miracle. And some days are hard. I'm not saying that you have your days where you get up and you know, you're know tired and you don't want to go on. But the BYL really does help. Dr. Cantley, you are a miracle worker. You've given me extra life, longer life. Seven years on your pill has helped me to survive to see my children get married, to see my babies being born. It definitely was the best thing. You are a genius, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. What an incredible story. Linda's testimonial really demonstrates how innovations like Dr. Cantley's can change the course of a person's life. But true innovation is not always easy. It requires high risk taking and openness to new ideas even those that may initially seem wrong. And that's exactly why Dr. Cantley is our 2020 Dr. Pauli Janssen Award recipient. Dr. Cantley, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here and congratulations. Well, it's a tremendous pleasure. Yes, and it's a tremendous pleasure for us. And on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, we just want to say how wonderful it is that you made the journey here to be here at the Johnson & Johnson Museum. Thank you for being here with social distancing, of course. Yes. Yes. So, you know, you've just won the Dr. Paul Janssen Award. Why are awards like this important? Why is recognition for science so important? Well, I think, you know, we need to inspire the next generation that um, it is possible to make discoveries that will really improve the lives of people. And, you know, I think young people are taught as they grow up and go to high school and college, they see all these textbooks of biology and biochemistry. And they pretty much assume that it's all understood now. It's all done. But it's not done. I mean, we our understanding of the complexity of human life and, and uh, disease, we've only touched the you know, tip of the iceberg. Mm. And I'm an optimist. I think that uh, with the knowledge that we're acquiring and we're accelerating our knowledge, uh, that um, there's hardly any disease that we can't improve on. Wow. That's, that, that's, that's pretty optimistic. That's wonderful. Take us back, actually, several years, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, where were you in science, and what inspired you into a career in science? So I grew up in rural West Virginia and didn't even know a scientist. Um, closest I came to a scientist was a family doctor. And... Um, but my father was very science-driven. He learned, he was in the Coast Guard during World War II. He learned a lot about, uh, he was a signal man, so he could uh, sig send signals, Morse code. Yeah. 
Uh, and, uh, but he also learned everything about weather. So when I was growing up, I would, if, if I asked my father, why does it rain? He would go into great detail about how particles form and uh, water is uh, you know, developing a size that's enough to allow the rain to drop. My, you know, my friend's fathers would say, well, God made it rain so we could have vegetables and so forth. So the great uh, focus on understanding really at the molecular level how think everything works was really initiated from my father. My mother was also a brilliant woman and went to college while I was about 12 years old. And, and so she had an influence I, on your life as well. She had a big influence. Uh, my t two brothers and sister and I would help her study for her classes every night. So four kids That's went through college in four years, got her degree. Um, so we were very inspired by her that college can't be that difficult and by my father that you can figure out everything. And, so tell us a little bit about what got you interested in PI3K? Um, and when did this happen? When you were a postdoc? It happened, no, it happened when I was uh, an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, um, I was trying to understand how insulin works. And yeah. at that time, insulin, we knew that insulin, you know, controlled glucose levels, but we had no idea how it did it. Mm. And so, the insulin receptor had not yet been purified. We didn't even know what it did. Uh, and so in the course of trying to understand that, I started getting deeper into signal transduction, we call it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what happens inside a cell whenever a growth factor or hormone binds to the outside of the cell. And it was the course of the, <clears throat> excuse me, it was in the course of doing that that I stumbled upon this literature on phosphatidyl inositol, a lipid that's on the, it's on the inner leaflet of the membrane that surrounds the cell. So in the inside of the cell, it's right, you know, if, you're, if the room is like a cell, it would be on the inside wall. And that lipid had been shown to be phosphorylated the year I was born. And, and there was just emerging data that it may be involved in transmitting these signals. But how it was doing it wasn't clear. And we discovered that it could be phosphorylated at the site, the three position, that's where the PI3K is. Uh -huh. That's the site on that lipid that the phosphate is added to. And that had been missed for the previous 35 years mm -hmm. of research on yeah. lipid chemistry. Yeah. And that discovery really opened up the field because it ended up explaining insulin, how insulin works, but also how most cancers work. They activate that same pathway that insulin activates. Now, were there naysayers, like people who didn't believe you? Um, oh, oh, yes. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that, and yeah, there what was, was that like? It was complicated because doing an assay of phosphorylene in a lipid is complicated because you have to make a membrane, a synthetic membrane, and using sonifier. And, and if, if the lipid was not presented in the context of a membrane, like the cell membrane, then the PI kinase wouldn't phosphorylate it. And so having worked on membranes as a, as a graduate student and postdoc, I knew how to make membranes and, and therefore used that and that's how I did the assay. But the other people who were doing research on oncogenes and insulin weren't as, well, they had never really worked with membranes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they really didn't know how to make a synthetic membrane. So when they tried to repeat our results, they couldn't do them. And literally my graduate student, Malcolm Whitman, and Tom Roberts' graduate student, David Kaplan, had to take a sonifier to the various laboratories, sonify the lipids, present, give them to, the, to, the, to their students and postdocs so they could then do the experiment the way we did it, and then they could reproduce it. And so for a couple of years, most of the major people in the field said, this is not true. Hmm. And the lipid chemists also didn't believe it because they couldn't believe they had missed for 35 years the most important lipid in the cell. And they, I remember one, of, one said, if this turns out to be true, I will eat my hat. <laughs> um, so and for a couple they, of years, they, nobody believed us. Yeah, and did they eat their hat? I, I <laughs> <laughs> probably not. <laughs> No, that's, that's fascinating because it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of perseverance, it takes a lot of belief in your own idea 
to stand up to people who don't believe you, because especially, you know, years of years of research and dogma. So um, what gave you the inspiration to keep moving on? Well, first of all, I knew it was true. I mean, I'm just trained as a chemist. Yeah. And the good thing about chemistry is you're either right or you're wrong. You know, you either have the right structure or you don't. And so when I knew I had the right structure, I knew there was no doubt it was true. I knew it would take a while to convince other people of that, but it didn't matter. It sort of gave, it gave us a head start on everyone else because nobody else worked on it because they thought it was false. So we got a couple of years head start in, in a way. It was, it was hard to get funding for it because the reviewers of the grants didn't believe it, but we, we continued to pursue it. So what's next? What scientific questions fascinate you? Because, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, you said there is still so much more to be discovered. There's still so much more to do. What fascinates you and what's next? You know, my trouble is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone tells people you should focus on your science, focus on one thing. <laughs> the truth is my lab is doing 20 different things. And I, that's one reason I've been able to attract really fantastic postdocs and graduate students, because I let them do anything they want to do. They come in and say, I have an idea. And I said, okay, pursue it. And, you know, I come in and look at their data and see whether I, it made sense and make, throw ideas out. Uh, but they could do it or not do it. it was, I, I believed in recruiting really, really smart people, throwing money at them, and let them take their risks, and then try to get them back on the path if it doesn't come out, if it doesn't work out right. But giving them that freedom allows them, when they leave my lab, to take projects with them and start their own lab. And so a lot of very incredibly successful students and postdocs uh, have come through my lab. We're all still great friends. We have try to have lab retreats together and everybody keeps tells everyone else what they're doing. They collaborate with each other and with me. So it's it's been, I, you know, I just have a lot of fun doing science. And that allows me just to do a lot of different things in parallel. And, um, you know, everybody gets credit for it. And so it helps everyone out. That's great. What lessons have you learned about how scientific research should be conducted? Well, I think it has to be, you know, obviously it has to be rigorous, reproducible. Uh, that's why that, uh, you know, David and Malcolm took that sonifier out to multiple labs to so that they could reproduce what we did. Uh, I like to do collaborations with other labs because other labs because if they can really get the same result as my graduate students, then I know that you know it's reproducible and we're we're not doing something silly. Uh, so I think in, you know, collaboration is really where you make progress. And a lot of people want to be secretive. They're afraid somebody else is going to steal their idea. You know, I, I don't care who steals my idea. I just want it done, tested, and, and see if it works or not. Well, That's the way you make progress. Yeah, spoken like a true scientist. Um, last question. What message do you have for the next generation of scientists? Well, I think you have to be curious, you have to be brave, you have to be, I think you have to throw ideas around, being secretive about what you think might be the one thing that's going to get you success. If you're only going to have one success, you're not going to be successful. You have to do, you know, you have to be successful throughout a long career. And to just have one idea and work on it the rest of your life is not, to me, a, a fun way to live your life. So explore. Think of crazy ideas, throw them out there, see if somebody can uh, can criticize them. And if they survive the worst criticism, maybe they're worth trying. So that's that's the way I've run my lab, and it's uh, it's been fun. Great advice for the future generation. And Dr. Cantley, your work inspires us. We want to congratulate you uh, for winning the <coughs> Dr. Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research. You know, typically, if we weren't you know, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, what would typically happen is that you would have the leadership of Johnson & Johnson, our chairman and CEO, our chief scientific officer would all be here, and we would stand up here and actually physically take this award and hand it I over to you. I could even shake your hand. <laughs> yes, and you would, shake, you would shake hands, and obviously we can't shake hands. So on behalf of Johnson & Johnson and on behalf yeah. of the leadership of Johnson & Johnson, and all the employees of Johnson & Johnson. We wish you all the best. We want to congratulate you. We want to bestow on you the Dr. Paul Janssen Award for Biomedical Research. 
virtually, of course, social distancing. So will you please accept this award? Yes, thank you very much. It's beautiful. I, it'll be, it's, uh, I'm incredibly honored by this. I, you know, I want to thank the selection committee, the, the Jensen Selection Committee, which are an incredible group of people, I should say, uh, yes. uh, that, that have selected me for this. I want to thank Johnson & Johnson for this whole day and, and your, what you've done for me. Um, I, particularly, I have to thank my wife. Yes, please do. Uh, my wife, Vicki Sato, she, we've known each other for 40 years now, and she's, uh, she's been an inspiration. I'm a chemist and a bit of a biochemist or biophysical chemist, not a biologist. I've never had a biology course in my life. I'm, I'm sure I'm the only cancer center director who's never had a biology course. So what biology I learned, I learned a lot from my wife, who was a biologist, uh, still a biologist, although she now does, you know, moved from being a Harvard professor where we met in the faculty at Harvard mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to uh, become a president of Vertex Pharmaceutical Company. She then left and became a professor at Harvard Business School and Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and then left that to go on to start venture, co uh, venture capital companies, yep. uh, biotech companies, she's on board of directors and everything. So she is so connected and tells me, I, she's a sounding board for every idea I have. What about this, what about this, what about this? So she knows immunology, she knows biology, and my first critic, she's the best critic. My two daughters, I have to thank them so much too. You can imagine growing up yeah. with two parents like us who were traveling everywhere, mm -hmm. every week, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they could be neglected. I think we neglected them just enough to allow them to be independent. <laughs> they probably are su so successful because we traveled all the time and they could go do their own thing. Uh, so they were, they, the older one is a professional ballroom dancer, mm -hmm. Rico, mm -hmm. and teaches Lovely. the next generation ballroom dancing. She competes all over the world. Wow. And the younger one is sort of in the footsteps of both me and my wife. She mm -hmm. became a PhD in chemical biology at Harvard and then went on to become a venture capitalist. So right. she's, the two of them have been just great fun and uh, never caused us any trouble. <laughs> well, you know, if uh, and under normal circumstances, as I said, we would have had um, your family join us. We would have been having dinner in New York City. Um, but of course, you know, can't do that, but please give them our regards. Um, you know, the Paul Janssen family and the award winners family become part of the Johnson & Johnson family. So, you know, we, um, we, um, we just want to send them our best regards. And, um, you know, hopefully, who knows, by next year, COVID will be gone. Maybe we'll have a vaccine. We'll all be able to travel. And, um, you know, you can come visit Belgium with, um, you know, your, your family and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful time. Great. Belgium's one of my favorite places to visit. Yes. So. Glad to be back there. Yes, and you could go visit uh, Dr. Paul's uh, laboratory and, and their family. Dr. Paul Janssen's family typically joins us in Belgium, and so they too send uh, their regards to you as well. So thank you once thank again. You. Congratulations on being the 2020 Dr. Paul Janssen Award winner. Dr. Cantley, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So it's voices like Dr. Cantley's that actually need to be championed, especially at times like these. Today's program has left me feeling inspired, and I hope it's done the same for you all as well. I'm amazed by the incredible impact science can have on individual lives and empowered by stories of Shreya and Lisha and other emerging innovators who make me feel truly hopeful about the future. Finally, today is all about the recognition and the legacy of a man who never gave up, even in the hardest of times, and always put patience first. Dr. Paul Janssen's legacy lives on in these awards and the honorees furthering his mission. And for those of you out there watching, thank you for tuning in today. I hope each of you found some inspiration in these stories and conversations. And let's continue to learn, continue to question, and continue to champion science. Thank you. <laughs>